Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Landrigan. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, join this auspicious group and uh, talk to you this morning. Uh, I did narrow my talk a little bit to focus on um, synthetic turf because there's so much to say about it. And I'll keep track of the clock here and keep my comments on time. So um, before I even begin, I just wanted to throw out a thank you to uh, Megan Bullock and Drs. Galvez and Sheffield uh, two of my colleagues, uh, three of my colleagues, who have helped gather some of the pictures and data for this talk. Uh, they were invaluable. So the issues around synthetic turf have certainly been in the news a lot. This is just a couple of recent articles. One is from the Times from August. The other is from uh, a, a local paper in New Jersey from just this past November um, with all kinds of uh, information and concerns about uh, playing fields and the uh, current trend towards installing synthetic turf fields for a variety of reasons and what environmental health issues they may pose and risks to our kids. And the reason is that the, this is so hot in the press and in many of our minds is that the growth of this uh, industry has been fairly dramatic in the last decade. Um, this is just from one of the companies that produces field turf, which is one of the more common ones that has been installed, I believe, in New York City in a number of places, that shows the growth uh, in installations. This is the number that they put in. And you'll notice that most of it's uh, a little highlighter here is gone. Oh, here it is. Uh, pretty dramatic in the last decade, and most of it's in the United States. The dark blue is the proportion that's U.S., so we're sort of leading the way. Um, and the same is true for, for several of the companies. So, so why is this happening? What's the big move to synthetic turf? Well, I had to do a little research myself. Um, the big push started in the 50s um, from the Ford Foundation when they were, uh, there was a big interest in improving physical fitness. Um, there was a great belief that Americans were not fit enough, that we needed more physical activity, and this was part of a push to have more accessible uh, sporting facilities and fields, with the concept being that you know, there's a, it's a lot of work to maintain grass and have it available all the time, and so synthetic fields will be there 24-7, and you can use them all the time, and people can have more exercise. And the first kind of turf was uh, AstroTurf. Now, you can still find this stuff around in a few places, um, and everyone knows of the Houston AstroDome, which of course had synthetic, the first generation synthetic turf installed. Turns out actually interestingly that two years before in my hometown of Providence, Rhode Island at a very well known uh, private school there, Moses Brown, they installed the first field there made of AstroTurf. Since then there's been a lot of uh, advances, I would say, and changes in the design of AstroTurf. So the second generation which began in the 90s and led to this sort of second wave of installations uh, is a sort of very different product, um, and we'll talk about how it's made out of these little fibers or uh, artificial grass blades and then this fill, this uh, infill. But the reason uh, for needing more physical fitness and activity has certainly not gone away, and I just threw this slide in that I had used in another talk. This is CDC data, and just reminds us that the, there is a real epidemic of obesity in the United States. And this is just the last 10 years from 1990, uh, 15, 18 years. 1990 to 2006, and now we're in 2007. The redder it gets, the worse it gets, and uh, uh, no, no relation to politics. Um, but clearly, the, the red uh, states here mean that more than 30% of the population uh, is uh, really morbidly obese with a BMI of greater than 30, which is just enormous. And this is a pretty dramatic change. Um, so it reminds us that there really is an issue about physical fitness as part of the way to address obesity, and we shouldn't ignore that. So here's the old stuff. This is AstroTurf. Actually, if you know where Asphalt Green is, uh, not far from here, they have an outdoor field that's old-fashioned AstroTurf. My kids went to camp there for a few summers, and uh, you know it's like this squishy, spongy stuff. It has this little thin layer on top that's very squishy, and then underneath it's got this kind of rubbery stuff, and when it gets wet, it's like skating on ice. Um, there was a lot of issues in the beginning with AstroTurf. You might remember turf toe and a whole variety of different uh, sorts of physical injuries that occurred with this sort of turf. This is the new stuff. This is the second, some people call third generation actually, uh, synthetic turf. And it, the way it's made is just basically so we understood, I had to sort of learn about this. There's this complex layer underneath that's got some shock absorbing properties and a nice drainage system to get water off of it. And then above it they have these little uh, synthetic um, grasses, essentially, plastic grasses, and they're filled in between with this uh, rubber infill, this granular stuff, and uh, Dr. Galvez kindly brought me a little sample. If anybody, well, actually, I'll pass it around. You can pass it as we go. 
And the purpose of that is to keep the little hairs standing up straight and to make it cushiony and soft and more like grass. So this is the infill rubber that I'm passing around, and it's made out, I don't even read the names, but a bunch of different polymers of rubbers. Uh, they're about a millimeter in diameter on average. Um, sometimes it's mixed with sand, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's made with new rubber or uh, natural rubber or synthetic rubber. And a lot of times, part or all of it comes from recycled tires. And actually, some of the issue is that it's, there's a lot of compounds in recycled tires, some of which are not measured, that get in there. And it varies a lot depending on the manufacturer or the uh, installation or the infill that's been put in there. So as I sort of reviewed this, I think it's really quite an interesting balancing act. I think the intention is to do good here and provide good access to athletic fields so people can be more active and our kids can be more active. And that's clearly a very important thing. So on the positive side, what's argued is that you get more use out of the fields. That's certainly true, but the degree to which it's true may vary and not be as um, stark as sometimes portrayed, uh, to increase physical activity and decrease ob obesity. There are some environmental benefits, although there's some issues with this. One is you don't have to water synthetic turf, at least not the way you do grass, although there's issues with heat and water is used to cool it. So this, again, you probably use less water than you use, but in terms of the broad spectrum, there is probably some water conservation. There's this, people argue about the carbon footprint, so you don't have to run gas-powered electric mowers as much if you're not mowing gas. So there's some sort of broader uh, it, savings there. It's a place to put those recycled tires and use them, and there's a huge issue with what to do with the millions of recycled tires we have every year. And then there's discussion about cost savings. Is it cheaper? That's also somewhat debatable, but that's certainly an argument that's made. On the other side of the scale are what are the potential downsides, the harms here. So heat is certainly a well-proven one, and we'll talk about the excessive heat generated on these surfaces as opposed to grass. Um, and then there's the toxins that we could be exposed to through these surfaces, and particularly the rubber infill, particularly recycled tires, seems to be one of the larger issues. Um, that doesn't stay on the fields, and as uh, anybody you know who has kids who play on these fields will tell you, it comes home in their socks and into your house. Uh, if it rains, it runs off into the sewers or storm drains, so the toxins that are present get dispersed beyond the field. Um, it, larger environmental heat effects, does this uh, sort of affect the heat island effect? Uh, because it's generating more heat overall in our environment. And that, again, uh, I think is a lot more to learn. <clears throat> I mentioned the contamination. And then the habitats, where you're losing natural habitats and replacing them with uh, artificial grasses. Um, although, again, there's a lot of debate over just how significant that is. So just to touch on this a little bit, clearly um, there's decreased maintenance requirements for these fields. And definitely they're more available, and it does help combat obesity. They really are sort of 24-7 if they're um, put together properly, and that, that's definitely an advantage there. Um, you don't have to fertilize them, put pesticides on them, mow them, all that sort of stuff. And they may have lower long-term costs. Some people argue they look nicer. Certainly they look nicer than, say, a dust bowl. And anybody who works at Mount Sinai, my office overlooks the park, and there's an area there that's used constantly for soccer that's a dust bowl. Um, and in fact, the particulates in the air and the dust generated during the summer there come in my window if it's open. Uh, so there's clearly, it depends on what you're comparing it to. And again, aesthetics and the use of recycled tires are good things. On the downside, though, this crumb rubber that we're passing around there contains lots of stuff. And there's been a variety of uh, attempts to investigate that. Amongst them are metals like zinc and lead and some of these others, and uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons or organic compounds that have toxicities, phthalates and phenols. Um, and the concern is that some of this stuff gets in the air and then you breathe it in, or it gets in your eyes or your mouth and be irritating, that maybe can be absorbed to the skin. And then in young kids, as Dr. Landrigan pointed out, because of some of their unique vulnerabilities and behavior, it's going to get on their hands and in their mouths and get swallowed to some degree. Another significant health effect is the heat. And in fact, there's actually been some examples of burns, actually skin burns, from the heat generated in these fields. And the issues about when athletes, a lot more of the sort of written Documents on this are in athletic fields for high school and college and pro football. Um, but there's issues of increased dehydration and problems with the athletes around that. There's questions about are injuries worse or less or different on synthetic turf from grass. And then turf burns and infection risk in particular is sort of hot. Um, is there more abrasions of the skin and does it put you at greater risk of infection, particularly MRSA? 